So next, we're going to start our session on the heart. And to introduce it and to set the stage is Dr. Linda Kripe from um, Nationwide Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. All right, thank you. And um, the only thing I can say is that as a clinician here, I think that all of us would stand together with you to say that these stories move us in ways um, that inspire us and, and, and result in us going back to the workplace on Monday and working even harder um, to try to help um, this community find a path forward that's, um, that is full of hope. And so I thank you for sharing your story because I think it, it does make me work harder on Monday. So with that, we're going to have to do some work. And one of the things we're going to have to work on is the heart. And um, I'd like to talk to you today um, and, and introduce um, a session on um, cardiovascular disease and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I came up here, and I forgot to learn how to do this. I hope this works. So the big button, yeah. <laughs> so. All right, here's, here's where we start. Why should we all be interested in the heart? Not only does it um, the engine of, in, engine of the body and make us go, but um, the heart is a muscle too, and, I, and a very, very important muscle. And I, and I think those of you who've been to this conference for years um, has heard a number of us um, through the years talk about this on multiple occasions and and I think it's now more important than ever that we start thinking about the heart especially as we're looking at treatments that could potentially impact skeletal muscle because not only do these treatments have to impact skeletal muscle but they also have to impact the heart if we are going to change the face of this disease um, you may walk longer, you may use your arms and limbs longer, but you will not live longer until we impact the cardiovascular disease. And so as we talk to each other, as we talk to people who are working in the field, as we talk to drug companies, I, I um, would like to uh, inspire you to keep that conversation going, that we need to include um, cardiovascular endpoints in these clinical trials and we need to make sure that we understand the natural history and we need to understand that we um, need to be thinking about the heart at all times, especially in um, anyone who is um, affected um, with a, this dystrophinopathy. So, but before we start, let's, let's talk about some important heart vocabulary that you may hear this afternoon. A cardiologist is a heart doctor, um, and a heart doctor should be, or a cardiologist should be a, a part of your son's care or your care if you are, are a carrier. Um, some pieces of cardiovascular anatomy is you may hear about the atria, and the atria are chambers that receive blood in the heart, and there are two atria, a right atria and a left atria. There are also ventricles, and ventricles are the pumping chambers of the heart. There are two, and there are one on the left and one on the right side of the heart. And this is a term that I think is really important, cardiomyopathy. And cardiomyopathy is a term that we use for disease of the heart muscle. And all patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy have a cardiomyopathy because they're, not only is their skeletal muscle affected, but their heart muscle is affected. Heart failure is a term that's really, really scary and frightening, and it's often used um, in a very cavalier fashion by cardiologists because we sometimes are moving too fast in our daily lives. It doesn't necessarily mean that your heart or your son's heart is failing, but it means that the heart is no longer able to meet the body's demands. And that can occur during times of illness, even with reasonably normal cardiovascular function. The ejection fraction, often termed as EF or LVEF, left ventricular ejection fraction, is the measurement of the percentage of blood leaving the heart each time it contracts. And we're also going to be hearing this afternoon about fibrosis, which is um, the scar tissue that forms in the heart muscle. Just as a little primer before we move on into the meat of the afternoon, um, here's a picture of the heart, um, where if you look at the blue side, the blood returns from the upper half of the body and the lower half of the body into what we have called the right atria. The blood then moves into the right ventricle and gets pumped into the lungs where it picks up oxygen. It returns back to the heart with oxygen through the pulmonary veins and into the left atria. It then goes into the left ventricle and then gets pumped out to the body. So the, the, um, this is the pathway of the blood as it moves through the heart, and those ventricles need to squeeze appropriately in order for us to do our daily activities. 
This is probably the most important slide in the piece that I will be giving or talking to you this afternoon, and it's really a key concept in understanding Duchenne cardiomyopathy. The cardiomyopathy in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is characterized by what we call extensive subepicardial fibrosis. And as you can see on that image on the right-hand side, it's a pathology specimen, you can see that white um, scar tissue pointed out um, with the red arrow in the brown heart muscle. And that's the scar tissue that forms in um, the myocardium in this disease. It's very much like the scar tissue that forms in the skeletal muscle. On the left-hand side, you can see a piece of heart muscle that's stained. The, the muscle tissue is red, and that blue staining tissue is, um, is the fibrosis. Now, this is different than the, what we would see in a patient who has had a heart attack. In a patient who's had a heart attack, you would see that the scar tissue or the damage or, or the injury would be occurring on the inside of the chamber in the subendocardial region. But in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it has a very characteristic appearance and it is in the subepicardial region. So how should we care for the heart um, in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy? And we've learned a lot over the last um, decade plus, plus decade, and, and we don't have time at this moment to go through these guidelines. However, I would like to refer you to the care guidelines that were recently published this past year. This is a work by the um, CDC in conjunction with um, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy to try to establish care guidelines not only for cardiovascular disease but for pulmonary bone health, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you can read these in, in detail. And I, and I would encourage you to um, get a hold of this document. I think it's on the PPMD website and read it in detail because it really is a manual for care that I think um, is worth the effort and worth the time. To just briefly summarize what it says with regards to cardiovascular care, care should begin at diagnosis. You should meet your cardiologist or your heart doctor right after diagnosis. And, and, if, you're, and if your neurologist or your uh, neuromuscular provider is not offering that, you should ask to see a cardiologist. This is really important because it helps establish a relationship with your family that's going to be lifelong. You also need to know about cardiovascular care. Cardiovascular um, risk for maternal carrier, care Carriers is very real, and we had a conference um, uh, sponsored by PPMD that preceded this larger um, uh, conference where we talked about female carriers and their risk for cardiovascular disease. And it, and it is significant, it can be up to 50% of carriers we found in our study have some degree of myocardial fibrosis, like we just saw in that previous slide. So I think it's very important that mothers also take care of their hearts. And then this discussion can occur. Um, with, um, your, with your, your cardiologist. Cardiac evaluation should include a physical exam and cardiac testing, uh, which should include an EKG and non-invasive imaging. This includes an echocardiogram or cardiac MRI. <coughs> Excuse me, and in the early years, um, the patient should be seen um, year, yearly. This frequency will increase based on um, the individual patient's needs and as, as, the ch um, as the young man ages and the cardiovascular disease progresses, we oftentimes see sometimes the patients monthly or every um, two to three months. Cardiac evaluation should definitely occur before major surgeries and one of the most um, major surgery that would occur in this patient population would be um, scoliosis surgery. So right before um, your child would uh, undergo scoliosis surgery, we would definitely recommend a complete cardiovascular evaluation. And ACE inhibitors or cardiovascular medications are typically started prior to the age of 10 years. Now, this is a very random recommendation and um, was sort of um, chosen based on expert um, opinion and guidance. Um, but I think by the age of 10, we are starting to see those changes occurring in that heart muscle, and I think it's important to initiate treatment with an ACE inhibitor. Um, chest pain. I'd like to address chest pain in um, the Duchenne patient just a little bit. And here, um, Tarzan is having significant chest pain because um, he's thumping his chest a little bit too hard, um, as told by the doctor. But um, and musculoskeletal chest pain is extremely frequent. However, um, we have found um, that in the Duchenne patient, it it can be from other causes. Um, 
it's often dismissed if the, if the patient goes to the pediatric emergency room or if you end up going to an adult emergency room in particular because chest pain in kids is often thought to be musculoskeletal and chest pain in adults is often thought to be secondary to a myocardial um, infarction. However, cardiac evaluation, so cardiac evaluation is rarely undertaken. You might get an ECG, and a child would rarely get a cardiac troponin. A cardiac troponin is a blood test that's drawn, and it's a very sensitive and, and reliable marker of cardiac tissue or injury. Cardiac troponin, is, in general, is minimally elevated um, at baseline in the Duchenne patient, or just mildly so. So if your child does experience chest pain, I would recommend trying to get to a pediatric emergency room if possible. And if you can't get to a pediatric emergency room, go to an adult emergency room and make sure they don't treat them as if they're having a heart attack. But I do think that it's important to call um, the uh, ER, our physicians' attention to the fact that um, children with Duchenne can often have troponin elevations and the troponin should be, probably be checked. We hypothesize that this chest pain is related to um, progression of the DMD cardiomyopathy and it results from periodic um, injury to the heart muscle rather than from continuous ongoing injury and that this what is happening is that you're having a series of silent recurrent events, and these silent recurrent events will eventually lead to cumulative injury. And it's a process that's very similar to that which occurs in the skeletal muscle. And so as we begin to understand the cardiovascular disease, we understand that the disease is likely progressing in a stepwise model as opposed to a linear one. We don't know if there could be external triggers such as viral infections, psychological stress, or other illnesses, and we have a lot of work to do with regards to understanding this. I don't want everybody running into their emergency room, however, at the slightest onset of just a little bit of chest pain. In those instances, it probably is musculoskeletal, but I think what if your child is experiencing significant chest pain, they're crying, they're bent over, and as a parent, you say this just isn't right, that's the type of chest pain I want you to take your child into the emergency room for. Let's move on to some cardiac imaging, and, and Dr. Hora is going to be addressing this much more um, extensively. Historically, it was believed that in Duchenne, this cardiomyopathy or this heart muscle disease did not manifest until late um, teenage years or adult years, and if you pick up an old textbook, that's what you'll read. The disease was characterized, however, at a time when imaging was much less sophisticated. Um, and that was thought was, if you couldn't see it, it must not be there. However, now we have much better tools which allow us to see important new things in the myocardium. And I suspect that as we get even better and more sophisticated tools, we're going to be revisiting the definitions that we even are currently using. Imaging has allowed us to redefine the natural history of Duchenne cardiomyopathy, and as the imaging improves, like I said, we're going to be seeing this disease with new eyes all the time. Two imaging modalities are commonly employed. One is an echocardiogram, and the other one is cardiac MRI. An echocardiogram, however, has its limitations. The three images on the top bank are taken from a child without Duchenne muscular dystrophy, <coughs> and the three images in the lower panel across the bottom are taken from a child with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The image quality is poor in many patients with Duchenne, especially the non-ambulatory patients, and this is because of a variety of issues. It's related to water content of the tissues, it's related to the inability to position um, the patient well, especially boys who can't easily get out of their wheelchairs, and it has to do with lung and scoliosis and a lot of things. And so echocardiography is not an ideal way to image the heart in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. If that's all you have, that's what you're going to use. But um, we, have, we have better ways to see what's going on in the heart at the moment. Cardiac MRI is the image um, modality of choice, in my opinion, in this disease, and it has significant advantages. You lack radiation exposure, and it allows you to get detailed information with regards to left and right ventricular function, fibrosis quantification, and myocardial strain. There are some disadvantages, however, in that an IV is required um, for fibrosis quantitation. There, there can be longer scan times, and sedation um, may be needed, though we do not like to use sedation at our institution. And um, one thing that I think 
should not be um, taken lightly is that it isn't available everywhere yet. So I think that that can be a major obstacle. And um, we are very blessed this afternoon to have Dr. Hoare, who's one of the leading experts in the imaging of Duchenne cardiomyopathy through the use of cardiac MRI to share um, some of uh, the things that he's found um, in, in his studies and in his practice. So in summary, the heart is an important muscle too. Duchenne chest pain may signal acute cardiac injury. Cardiac troponin levels and EKG should be obtained. Um, cardiac MRI is a valuable tool to evaluate cardi Duchenne cardiomyopathy. And in conclusion, the heart is a muscle too. And, and truly, I think that all of you in this room can help all of us cardiologists up here continue to make this a priority, continue to push people to make sure that we understand the cardiomyopathy better and that we're, use, we're incorporating um, cardiac imaging and clinical trials and that um, treatments will address the cardiac disease. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kripe. And now I think she alluded to the next topic, which is looking at some of the outcome measures and how we, how we measure uh, how the heart is functioning. So Dr. Hoare. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, P PBMD, for the opportunity to be here. I think it's always an exciting time of the year for me um, to be here. I think, as Linda said, you hear stories such as Stevens that really invigorates us to kind of do better. Um, so um, I'm gonna be talking about cardiac measure outcomes and you'll see that Linda and I, although we did not work together for this, for this talk, there are some overlap, I think, which is great to have some repeated thing. But I think really the question you wanna know is how do we know that our treatment is working? I think that's really, at the end of the day, that's the question you wanna know. So here's the objective of my talk today. We're gonna to talk about the defined Duchenne muscular dystrophy using cardiac uh, outcomes measure through the use of uh, cardiac MRI. I'll give you some summary application and kind of my thoughts on how you can, we can stage the disease uh, based on the, some of the criteria that's used by adult heart failure uh, guidelines. And hopefully at the end of a uh, conference uh, of the, this panel, we'll have some questions. So why are cardiologists interested in patients with neuromuscular disorder? I think that's a really great question and why should you be interested in it? I think to me it's really simple. So you know, the heart is the most active uh, muscle uh, though it's not pumping at the moment, um, you know, uh, but it, it, it's such an important piece in terms of Duchenne as patients universally develop cardiomyopathy. So I think when you look at treatment, look in treatment option, I think, you know, look, look in the lessons from the past, I think treatment certainly offers hopes. I think the story about steroid uh, over the last two to three decades has really slowed slow the progression of the skeletal muscle disease and the pulmonology team has done a phenomenal job with uh, respiratory care that has um, uh, improving the survival of the boys. And then really what leads to this is that you have increased cause of death uh, associated from uh, associated cardiomyopathy. So I think here's a piece of information, uh, of a study that's really uh, important, giving you some insight to that. This uh, study from France looking at 119 patients at a chronic care facility, and they show that about uh, life expectancy at their center was 22 years of age without ventilation. With ventilation, uh, patients improve at 36 years of age, and this is all comers between Duchenne and Becker, so that's why the age is maybe a little older. Uh, and then they, uh, you know, it was concluded that respiratory management improve, uh, as respiratory management improve, cardiac disease will play a major role in disease-related uh, mortality. So if you can see the, uh, in the red circle here that the predominant respiratory cause of death before 1990, and after 1990, it was predominant cardiac cause, or at least more cardiac cause was evidence. So in defining DMD-associated heart disease or DM, uh, dystrophin-associated uh, heart disease, I think the past clinical course really was at a time when imaging was less sophisticated. You know, I think Dr. Craig was certainly ahead of her time in terms of her thoughts in converting the imaging uh, aspect. And really, you know, cardiomyopathy did not manifest until late in early adult teens and in children. If we cannot see dysfunction, it must not be there. Now, we know that the myocardium is dystrophin deficient or absent, and cardiac disease is present at birth with abnormal EKGs, and disease progress with time and best assessed by non-invasive imaging. And that cardiac disease is a significant contributor to disease-related morbidity and mortality. So image of the heart will be obtained to uh, get structure and function as you come uh, and be seen at any one of the clinics. And there are two common ways. One is by echocardiogram, which is on the left panel, and the other one's by cardiac MRI. I will be talking predominantly about cardiac MRI. 
I think as Dr. Kreip alluded a little, a little bit earlier, traditionally we've been using echocardiogram partly because there are many advantages. It comes to you, it's easily available, can be done fairly quickly, uh, and it's a great first line tool. Unfortunately, as, you know, as the boys age, they get on different medication, develop some scoliosis, or need um, uh, different therapy. Um, as all of us, as we get older, it's much harder to see, and it detects really global cardiac dysfunction. So as shown in, in this uh, um, uh, panel here, on the top panel is a younger boy with uh, you know, good images and heart function is normal, so it's squeezing normally. On the, other, on the bottom images, many times as the boys get older, echo really uh, becomes much more difficult to see. Part of it is that you, know, um, you have uh, changes in the body that makes it difficult for ultrasound to penetrate. Now, cardiac MRI you know, is, is allows you to really accurately measure traditional measurements, including function by ejection fraction, uh, late, gadolinium, late gadolinium enhancement for scar or myocardial fibrosis or scar, and then some newer techniques uh, that uh, involve myocardial strain for contractility. There are many other techniques that are currently available that I won't talk about because they're not ready for clinical use yet. So there are some disadvantages that's been purported, although we have found that if you are asking to get it done, I think SICE can, uh, can um, perform this. You know, IV placement is needed for scar imaging, though new techniques that are in the pipeline may supplant the need for that in the future. Studies may take longer. Uh, in our institution, when we first started a long time ago, really, we're spending 90 minutes, and then it went to 60 minutes, and now we're doing studies in less than, you know, about 30 minutes. New techniques that are, are faster will uh, obviate the need for breath holding uh, and will improve the speed. And patients uh, don't have to hold breaths as much anymore, but they do have to lay still. And although this is uh, um, not readily available as echocardiogram, we know that uh, as the different sites are becoming, uh, you know, the certified Duchenne sites, I think uh, the teams are becoming more aware that the, the use of cardiac MRI is becoming important. All right, so as I uh, indicate here, you know, you get good images regardless of age. You know, on the left is a, a younger patient with normal heart function. On the right, unfortunately, is a, 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 an older boy with abnormal function. Both of these images are equally good in terms of quality. Unfortunately, the uh, pan right panel is a, a young man that has significant cardiac dysfunction. You can see it's not squeezing um, at all. All right, so let's kind of deep dive a little bit into why we're, why we're giving this talk. So ejection fraction by cardiac MRI measures the global state and how well the heart squeeze. Um, so this is a paper that's written by um, a group at Cincinnati, when we were at Cincinnati with uh, Dr. Tandon here. So this looks at a, a group of uh, patients uh, here um, over time. You can see that there are some variability and that has to do with what ejection fraction is. It's a very low dependent uh, um, a type of index, it's really good to use, but it can have some uh, variations. Um, but what you can see is that it all declines individually over time, and as a group, as patients get older, there are more patients with ejection fraction abnormality. So um, with PPMD, uh, we actually uh, looked at a natural history and put in um, uh, a large cohort of patients here and divided by age and looked at when do we start seeing abnormal heart function. So on the right panel here, you can see that uh, by the red, uh, the red arrow there, for the most part, before age 10 years, ejection fraction remains relatively normal. But once you start getting to 10 years of age, more patients have abnormal heart function uh, in, uh, in each of the age group. And you can see the curve on the right showing that the percentage of patients that have abnormal heart function increases substantially with, uh, with increased age. So when you talk about um, in looking at uh, revealing heart disease, cardiac MRI can track function by ejection fraction over time. It provides a mean to assess cardiac disease progression, provides a means to determine cardiac natural history while on traditional therapy, and provides the ability to assess therapeutic efficacy and, and trials. Now, cardiac function is a really, by ejection fraction is a good tool, and it's currently a gold standard tool for assessing cardiac uh, function. So EF is unfortunately a late finding when you have enough damage, and hopefully the next uh, sequence of slides will help show you that. Really happens, abnormality occurs when disease no longer, um, when the heart is no longer squeezing normally. So the question that we've been tasked with uh, from Linda was how do you look at the heart better? So Linda alluded to this earlier. So in looking at DMD heart disease beyond squeeze, we can look at myocardial fibrosis, the scar. So I'll walk you through this a little bit. So the scar is on the outer surface, so the sub the first outer layer, as outlined by the kind of pinkish uh, color there. 
And the pathologic specimen, uh, you can see the white areas that are on the outside and then the darker brown areas on the inside. That's the abnormal white area and then the normal brown area. And then his, the histological specimen here is the blue area there. This is in contrast to the patient with heart attack where the scar is actually on the inside or uh, a surface of the heart with subendocardial. All right, so I think we first published this um, in uh, demonstrating that fibrosis or scar was associated with ventricular dysfunction when heart no longer squeezed uh, normally. Now I think you know this is a little bit serendipity that um, there were a few patients actually that were enrolled that actually had scar imaging but had normal function. So you know we, uh, despite knowing that there's a high association with dysfunction, we actually asked the question you know was late gain limb enhancement or scar a precursor to cardiomyopathy induced muscular dystrophy? So that question was asked in 2007. I think that really triggered um, the, the quest. I think Linda then you know, had asked us, uh, along with Larry, well, maybe you, we need to do scar imaging. I would have to credit the family for really pushing this and getting an IV in, in the boys is sometimes quite challenging, but I think uh, you know, when the families came and real, realized that scar imaging was such an important piece, they really push on. You know, um, uh, to kind of help move this forward. I think this is, you know, credit to you for being persistent. So in 2013, we put this, uh, um, uh, this data together and show that 17% of the boys, or, or 14 out of 83 boys, less than 10 years of age, has scar, the youngest being six and a half years of age. Now, by the time you're about 10 to 15 years of age, uh, uh, 52 out of 149 uh, patients, 34% uh, had scar. And then by the time you're uh, older than 15 years of age, 59% or... Uh, uh, um, 48 out of 82 percent of boys had scar, and this is all comers. Now they say, what about heart function? So we proposed that scar actually occurred before heart function. So now we looked at patients with no scar at all, and we found uh, a, no, a normal function, but found that 30 percent of those boys actually have scar. And what happens when they actually the function goes down? Well, when the function goes down, um, more than 84, 85 percent of the patients have scar. So if you, this is a really a, a graph that I think to me was really helpful in kind of looking at um, some of the points that was made by uh, Dr. Flanagan yesterday. I'll walk you through this here. So the patients that are in the blue dot or square are patients that have scar. The patients, uh, sorry, the red dots and the patients that are in the blue dots are the patients that do not have scar. It's not very surprising that LG or scar, the red square, uh, is more common with older age and abnormal function as shown on this, this graph here. I think what's really important is actually you have a cohort of young patients in the blue box that have the little red square there that actually have scar. On the other hand, you have on the on top of the red box is a cohort of boys actually that actually are older, have normal function, but yet have no scar uh, uh, either. I think this points towards some of the variability that can be challenging and when you look at these patients. This has to do with some of the modified genes. And we're working with Dr. Flanagan and, and trying to actually help reveal a little bit more of that information. So looking at the relationship of scar and, uh, and function, remember I said to you that uh, ejection fraction is not a great tool, but putting that on top of scar imaging. So in this graph here, it shows that patients with mild fibrosis or scar have worse ejection fraction decline. And then what you can see is that the more areas that you have scar, so when you go from no segments to multiple segment, the more likely you're going to have abnormal heart function. So LV ejection fraction is a, a good tool for sure, um, but there's another technique that we've been looking at using myocardial strain. So I'm going to walk you through that a little bit. So EF is great, but it's insensitive to alterations in regional performance, meaning that we have regional areas of scar, but yet EF is normal. So it really conceals underlying regional dysfunction. It, it tells you you don't have disease when you actually have disease. It's probably the best way to put it. That's where scar imaging becomes important. So that makes it not an ideal index of contractility. Still a good tool. So this lack of regional assessment is a major limitation to um, ejection fraction. So as part of that, um, I was tasked with looking at a more sensitive way beyond squeed, looking at a cardiac function. So strain imaging was uh, one of the techniques that we were using, and it's really fundamentally important in assessing contractility globally uh, as well as regionally. What it does allows detection of disease earlier than scar formation or ejection abnormality. So why use my, what is myocardial strain? As I said before, it's a special technique that looks at heart muscle contractility beyond what ejection fraction can tell you. Detection, so why use that? So well, detection of disease early will allow better understanding of disease manifestation and really shift the paradigm from rescue to prevention. I think with gene therapy and many things that we're doing earlier, I think that's really important to have understanding of disease earlier. 
So a really brief concept on strain. So displacement and velocity, like ejection fractions, motion as the rectangle is moving from the screen left to screen right. Now strain on the hand is, is contractility. You can see the grids that are there. The liver doesn't contract, so it stays like a square. But the heart itself contracts, so it actually distorts. Strain can be seen in three uh, different directions. Positive strain is when it's stretching in the radial direction, and negative strain is in a sh shortening in both the circumferential and uh, longitudinal uh, direction. So um, this paper really showed that circumferential strain magnitude is lower dec uh, and declining with age despite normal ejection fraction. So if you pay attention to the red box here, the panel on the left side show that uh, a normal control, uh, boys less than 10 years of age and boys greater than 10 years of age all had normal ejection fraction. On the right panel, then you have the strain magnitude, the low the strain magnitude, the worse your heart function is decline uh, with age alone compared to normal. And when you actually have uh, strain magnitude further decline with uh, disease progressions, you can see here now when you develop scar, scar plus ejection fracture abnormality, your strain starts to go further down. So I think this paper was really helpful in, in helping us overcome some of the barriers to treatment by allowing us to look at a more sensitive and early method at uh, heart function beyond ejection fraction. Uh, this has led, led us to several papers, including a, a plenum trial uh, um, that show that strain was uh, significantly attenuated um, with treatment compared to placebo. So well, how about just over time, can you see differences? So we looked at a, a group of boys that had multiple studies over time, and we show on the panel here in the little blue, you can see the dot, that every single patient over time developed strain abnormality. At the same time, when you look at the ejection fraction, about a third of the boys actually had ejection fraction increase despite really no change in treatment. And, and this re likely represents that ejection fraction is sensitive to, um, uh, to the state of the patient at the time. All right, so myocardial strain uh, really allows us to detect cardiac uh, abnormalities earlier. Uh, further decline in strain magnitude with age despite normal global function by ejection fraction. Reduced EF or scar results in, in further decrease in strain. And a combination of increasing fibrosis or scar along with the further decline EF drop results in further reduction in strain. So what are we learning from cardiac MRI for outcomes measure? Well, it provides evidence of cardiac disease in a population with no routine way to assess heart failure symptoms provides the potential to create bio biomarkers of disease before the heart no longer squeezes normally, provides a mean to assess therapeutic efficacy, and provides data for disease cardiac progression uh, and modeling. We're working with PPMD and CPATH to hopefully model some of the data we've been collecting. So I'm gonna shift a little bit to look, to ask about heart failure symptom. I think this is commonly thrown at us, but really, um, you know, uh, really it's, it's, uh, we don't see this in our group because uh, the boys don't have that. So these are the traditional heart failure symptoms that are listed above. I'm not going to go through them just because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, the application in neuromuscular disease, particularly in uh, Duchenne and, and Becker, is really challenging due to skeletal muscle myopathy. So I'm going to walk you through the American Heart Association uh, heart failure. My adult colleagues really use this to kind of stage the disease. So stage A is presence of heart failure risk factors means hypertension, high cholesterol, and all the different things that we do, including smoking, but no heart disease. So if you have high blood pressure with no heart disease evidence, you're being treated because you're preventing that risk. Stage B occurs when you start seeing some, some, uh, some disease, meaning the, the muscle may be thickened, but you yet have no symptoms. Stage C, you start having some structural changes. The function may, be, occur, may start to decline. Patients start to have symptoms. And then stage D is really advanced disease. This type of classification really drives clinical practice and traditional heart failure treatment. It, and clinical trials include the use of these classification as a method of improved uh, treatment. So when you look at neuromuscular disorders such as Becker and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we know that these boys universally develop cardiomyopathy and heart failure. But the utility of this type of uh, classification is limited as la this lack of traditional heart failure symptoms, even in advanced stage of heart failure, is due to the skeletal muscle myopathy. So I'm gonna go through kind of a proposed way to look at this um, uh, heart failure staging using cardiac MRI. So if you look at heart failure stage A, no symptoms, of presence of disease risk factor. In Duchenne, the boys do not have dystrophin, or in Becker, they have dis uh, deficient dystrophin. So in stage A, no scar, normal heart function by ejection fraction, and patients have a tachycardia. Strain is abnormal, um, and no heart failure symptoms. Stage B then happens in the, in the uh, typical guideline is that there are no symptoms, but you see some structural changes. In Duchenne, you start seeing some scar. We notice that the scar is less than 50% thickness of the heart, and there's less than six out of 16 segments. And ejection fraction still is normal because there's not enough damage yet. 
but strain then continues to climb, and then regional strain is, is evidence. Yet the patients have no heart failure symptoms. Stage C or D in, in the uh, heart failure model, you see symptoms that are evidence. So you start having more scar now, that more than 50% uh, thickness, more than six out of 16 segments. Now you start involving different parts of the heart, including the apex uh, of the heart and then the septum of the heart. Heart function is finally abnormal with ejection, ejection fraction less than 55%. Strain further decline and the significant regional strain uh, abnormality, yet patients have no heart failure symptoms. So let's look at this kind of graphically. I think that's always helpful. So stage A, patients have fast heart rate, ejection fraction remains normal, strain is declining, uh, and the scar does nothing, uh, no symptoms. Stage B, then you start to have continued fast heart rate, ejection fraction is normal, strain starts to decline further, scar is evidence, um, and yet no symptoms. And then change C or D is you have fast heart rate continue. Heart function by global function by ejection fractions abnormal now. Strain further declines, and then you have scar that is significant, yet the patients have no symptoms. So I think this is really imp important in the take home message here. Staging cardiac disease by non invasive imaging techniques such as cardiac MRI is important as, tra as traditional heart failure symptoms and current markers of disease are not sensitive enough. And this is a major barrier to treatment, clinically as well as in research, is the understanding of cardiac na disease natural history. So I think surrogate uh, cardiac MRI markers is vital to not only understand and better characterize cardiac disease progression, but understand treatment in clinical uh, practice as well as in trials. So again, I'd like to thank you know, really PPMD and the family for really always pushing us for the uh, never-ending quest to find a cure. I think in order to find a cure, you really have to understand what you're trying to cure. Thank you. We're really grateful for all the work that you're doing, and I think we're, we're gradually getting closer to be aiming to, able to figure out the endpoints. So thank you very much. And now we have Dr. Duan from the University of Missouri, who's going to talk about, uh, you heard about the gene therapy microdystrophin contract constructs. He has one, or is working on one, that might have more benefits for the heart. Well, um, I want to thank uh, PPMD and uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to share some of our research data. And I also want to thank parents and the patients who are here today, and uh, hopefully uh, we, we've seen the microdystrophin coming to clinic and there's apparently next generation is coming. So, um, okay, I, I, I have a disclosure. I, I'm as, uh, on the SAC board for the solid biosciences. And uh, so uh, talking about microdystrophin, that wh why we're talking about microdystrophin, that all goes back to the, uh, that we need to talk about this uh, adenal associated virus. This is the smallest virus, uh, DNA virus. It's only about 20 to 25 nanometer. It have a small genome, about 4.5 4 uh, KB. So uh, like uh, if you want to find uh, AEV in a basketball, it's like you're trying to find a ping pong ball in the, oh, in the entire earth. So, so this kind, I hope this will give you an idea how small the AEV is. And, and the, there has been many uh, different ways to uh, improve AEV. And here is a more clear uh, a picture of the AEV uh, viruses. And if you look at the anatomy of AEV uh, briefly, it, it has uh, outside is, uh, what we call the capsid, and here is in green color. And inside is AEV genome. And the, the end of AEV genome is what we call the ITR. That's the AV packaging signal and, and the AV uh, replication signal. And then we have this uh, transgene. Uh, in the context of, uh, of, the, of, of uh, Duchenne, we have a microdystrophin. And before the uh, microdystrophin, we need to have a promoter to drive this gene expression. And then we have poly A to determine when to stop the, trans, uh, uh, the, the gene. And also there are some other elements so uh, effort has been taken to improve AAV. So uh, currently, uh, that uh, AAV 2.5, AAV 9, AAV Arch 74 have been used in Duchenne patients, and AAV 8 has been used in the uh, other uh, 
uh, neuromuscular disease patients. So uh, by uh, improving the, the capsid, uh, we can improve the delivery and potentially uh, reduce the immunity. Uh, there's another component in the AEV that you can improve, like you can add additional elements. It, it, we have unpublished data showing that by sticking in a small microRNA target uh, sequence in the AEV genome, we can substantially reduce the cellular immune response to the AEV. And also, you can incorporate some additional molecules that can further help improve the function uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Shin patient's muscle. And here, we, we have, in collaboration with Babu's lab at uh, uh, Rutgers University, we've shown that by knocking down the sarcolipine, which is a calcium regulator, you can also improve the uh, uh, function in the skeletal muscle and the heart and reduce the disease. And uh, apparently that there are ways that you can improve microdystrophin. So you can do colon optimization so that you can express more dis microdystrophin. And also you can remove the CPG to reduce the immunity. And apparently there's going to be these promoters that we can use a muscle specific promoter that can drive specific expression in the skeletal muscle, in the heart. There are also the promoters that we can use to drive expression in muscle stem cells. So uh, with all those improvements, we can improve the delivery, we can reduce the immunogenicity, and we can in increase the amount of the microdystrophin that's generated. But none of those approach will improve the quality of the microdystrophin. So uh, uh, we believe that not only the quantity, but also the quality are both important for DMD gene therapy. And, and there has been, there are published data showing that once you reach a certain threshold in, in the dystrophin level, the quality become more important than quantity. So here's an example, it's a study published by a group from Netherlands. So they uh, look at the dystrophin uh, levels. If you look at different symptoms, like uh, f first time, uh, the age you have the first model symptoms, and they have, I mean, uh, either you, you have early onset symptom or later onset symptom, you have similar level of the uh, dystrophin. If you look at the, using the walking, uh, 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 climb star stairs as, as a parameter, you can see that irrespective you happen early before 24 years or later after 24 years, you have similar amount of dystrophin. And it's the same thing for the using the walking aids to, to and the, again, you know, there's dystrophin Lever is not that uh, make a huge difference as long as you're above the, about here, uh, based on this study, about 10% of the dystrophin uh, in your uh, uh, body. So uh, he, here's uh, another uh, study uh, from uh, Kevin uh, Flanagan and, and uh, he, his collaborators. Here uh, I'm trying to show that, that, that if, you, if you look at that, this is looking at the BMD patients. They have inflamed deletions. And if you missing 45 and 46, 45 to 47 or 45 to 48, in all those inflamed deletions, you get your dy dystrophin back. But if you look at the, the genome or the phenotype, and if you have inframe deletion into 45, 46, you, most of the you would, uh, patient would have the DMD. But if you have a larger, like from 45 to 47 or 48, you have a large number of patients, they are ambulant, they are BND. So uh, there's a, another study looking at the, the, you know, what kind of dystrophin you have and what kind of disease you're gonna get. Uh, this is a study published by the French group, and they show that in, in patients that have a deletion from 45 to 47, they have early onset of dilat dilated cardiomyopathy, so your heart disease appears earlier. But if you have a different deletion, you have a deletion of 45 to 48 or 45 to 49, you can delay this cardiac disease by about 10 years. So uh, this says that, uh, you know, depending on what components you have in the dystrophin, you may get a different outcome. And uh, just to, before I get back to microdystrophin, and, and let's review the, the full-length dystrophin. The, the full-length dystrophin has uh, a messenger RNA, which uh, about 14 KB, 
If you take out the five prime and three prime and translate region, the seeding is about 11.8 kb. So this seeding encodes a protein that's about 427 kd, and this protein can be divided into several different segments. Like on the end terminal, it is is the green color. It's it's a, a acting binding domain. And the for that is a long uh, many numbers from one to twenty four and h one to h four this region is called the road domain and after that uh, it 's it's a yellow uh, color it 's a sixteen rich domain which uh, helps you get dystrophin to get to the bind to the membrane and following that is the c terminal at the very end and this uh, c terminal contains a lot of uh, binding motif for the signaling proteins like uh, centrophin and distro breathing. So, uh, so just a quick summary. Uh, so the full length dystrophin has about 14 kb messenger RNA and seeding is about 11.8 kb. And it contains six, 76 exons, four major domains. In the road domain, there are 24 repeats and four hinges. So what happens in the micro dystrophin? The seeding size is only about one third of the full-length CDNA. And the protein is all, also about one-third of the protein. The major difference is that they may have four or less than four domains. And their spectrum-like repeats often less than six. And they can have less than three hinges. So uh, before we uh, get to the area of the microdystrophin, uh, uh, Kate Davis's lab published this uh, many dystrophin patients. The patients have a huge deletion in the middle of the gene that deleted exon 17 to 48. So the, 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 the patient itself is a bodybuilder at age 25, and his uncle was walking around with, with, uh, at age 61. So this suggests that this 6.2 kb is only about 50% of the size of the full length dystrophin CDNA can protect uh, uh, the, 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 the muscle. But, but this is too big for uh, AEV, which at maximum you can put is about 5 kb. And so uh, can you make this f smaller? And with this, uh, apparently uh, the missing part is in the middle. If you cut out more, chop more, uh, more of the components in, in the middle. And uh, here I'm, I'm showing two examples. One is uh, published by Angelili's lab in 1996. They found a patient that actually have a, a microdystrophin size, but, but the patient is a severe Duchenne phenotype, suggesting that this microdystrophin is not helping. And Takita's lab, they developed uh, the first, uh, the, I, I call the generation zero my, synthetic microdystrophin. Again, they chop out the, the almost the entire rod domain. And again, it can put in, you can put that into AEV, but it cannot protect muscle. So, so if you look at that, the bottom line is that in all those uh, either naturally existing uh, uh, microgene or this first uh, generation zero microdystrophin, you have less than two spectrum-like repeats in there. So with this uh, recognition that uh, a number of new uh, microdystrophin genes were developed, here I'm showing the ones that uh, are currently being used by uh, three uh, companies in, in, in the gene therapy trials. And, and, the, and you can see that in all those microdystrophin that uh, they all uh, removed the C-terminal domain, which was, uh, exist in, in, in the previous, uh, in the first generation zero microdystrophin. And uh, the other huge difference is that now those microdystrophin, they all have more than four or five repeats. And this make, made a huge difference. So this minimized our oh, uh, microdystrophin. They can not only put into AEV, but they can also protect muscles in, 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 in animal models. So, uh, so um, how can we go from this? And, and here I'm, I'm trying to, to sh share with you two important components in, 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 in the, in the uh, dystrophin. And to share with you that how with or without this component uh, will make a difference. So the so first one uh, is going to be n uh, which is a very thick uh, uh, orange line there. That's for repeat 16, 17. The other I'm going to talk about repeat 1 to 3. That's uh, membrane binding domain 1, the first membrane binding domain. So uh, this is uh, a study uh, in, in mice. Uh, they compared two mice. 
one has this uh, 16, 17 announced binding domain, one does not have this binding domain, and uh, then you put those mice to, to, to on the treadmill to exercise, uh, and the one with the announced binding domain, that's the in red color, and they their performance keep going better and better. But the one that's in blue color, that, that don't have the NOS binding domain, you can see their performance just keep going down. If you take the muscle out for, 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 for exam, the muscle histology, the one with the NOS binding domain, that look perfectly fine, but the one without NOS binding domain, after this, a few days of exercise, you begin to see this uh, small uh, regenerative, uh, degenerative fall size. And uh, th this is a, a study published by a French group and uh, looking at what happens without, without NL spinal domain in, in patients. So they look at the patients that have identical uh, deletions from 45 to 55. And if you don't have NL, your clinical phenotype are all either se uh, severe with you know, different level of severity. And, uh, but if you look at the patient that have same mutation, but they still have the annulus uh, on the cell, uh, muscle cell membrane, the, their phenotype, uh, they, their disease is, uh, is much milder or moderate. So again, this suggests that having an annulus binding domain is probably important to, to, to improve the muscle function, uh, to enhance the therapeutic benefit that you can gain from the uh, microdystrophy. So, uh, Traditionally, I mean, this is a slide I, I made about 20 years ago, and, and this is at that time how we understand that dystrophy, uh, you know, interact w w with the different cellular proteins. And, and at the, there's a number, hinge four, there's a blue four and a CR, cysteine rich domain. On top of that, I have a thick red, short red line. And that is the binding side that got AV to bind to the muscle cell membrane. So for, oh, sorry. Got dystrophy to bind to the muscle cell membrane. The important, the, the reason that dystrophy can protect all muscle is that on one end, it has to bind to the muscle cell membrane. On the other end, it has to bind to the cytoskeleton. Without those, and basically, uh, your dystrophy will not be functional. And uh, a few years ago, uh, we found that actually, in addition to that original cysteine rich domain, uh, there are additional regions in dystrophy that also independently bind to the muscle cell membrane. So it's a repeat one to three is our first membrane binding domain. So uh, then we met a virus and look what happens. So this is a, a microdystrophy without that uh, first membrane binding domain. This is an assay uh, in the limb muscle, in, in the extensor digitorium longus muscle in mice. And so we're looking at the first drop of the uh, eccentric contraction. That's an injury contraction. If you contract more, then your force is going to keep drop. And uh, so, but after you add, uh, use a different microdistribution construct that contains this membrane binding domain, you can say that the force drop is much reduced. And, and we also look at that in the diaphragm, we see the similar uh, uh, beneficial effect, suggesting that if you have additional membrane binding domain, at least in mice, you may get some uh, benefit from uh, having this additional, uh, you know, uh, domains. So uh, besides uh, the, the, the announced binding domain and the membrane binding domain, there's also a very uh, unique domain uh, in, in the dystrophy, and that's in the repeat eight and nine. That part, it binds to a protein called polarity regulating kinase. So what does that do is that, uh, as we all know that uh, uh, a key uh, uh, issue in the Duchenne is that your muscle fails to regenerate, okay? So when muscle stem cells start to regenerate, it, it one cell divides into two. And the one of the stock cells will keep going to become mature muscle cell and the other will be, uh, remain as the stem cell. But if your cell divide without knowing which goes to what, and you will not be able to get one cell that can go to the mature dif differentiation. So this was, uh, was, was a finding made by uh, Mike Rudnick's lab, and they found that actually dystrophy binds this polarization regulating kinase. So to, in the stem cell, dystrophy kind of hooked the uh, 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 
you know, uh, uh, this polarizing protein to the one end of the cell. So this gives uh, a cell uh, a sense of your north side and south side. So when they divide, then you get like one, it remain as stem cell to generate a future stem cell. The other, it will be able to become a mature, mature muscle cell. But in DMD, in the absence of this uh, dystrophy in the stem cell, you essentially lost this, 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 this kind of, uh, a pole, this asymmetric division, you, both cells would divide the same, and they don't know what they're going to do. So uh, this is believed to be one of the issues that uh, uh, has uh, contributed to the disease in, in Duchenne patients. So uh, for a long time, it has been seen that, so that there's no way you can get AAV to the muscle stem cell. So here, uh, we used a, a mice that trying to see if AAV9 can get to the muscle stem cell. So this is a mice that have a TD tomato, that's a red fluorescence gene, and, uh, but in front of that, there's a stop codon, so you won't see the, the, the red uh, in this mice. But if we use AAV9 to deliver an enzyme called CRE, C-I-E, and then this enzyme can remove the stop codon, and then TD tomato will become red. And let's see what happens in the muscle after we inject. And you can see all the myofiber become red. That means that this AEV9 can get to the muscle. We know that. But what happened to the stem cells? And the stem cells are, are those very, very tiny cells. Uh, they are PAC7 positive. And, and uh, you can see that. The, uh, I don't know how easy it's because I cannot point to that. But, but in, in the kind in the middle part of, 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 of this individual images, you can see there's uh, one spot that has DAP, that's a nuclear, and PAC7, that's white and white. And also in the TD tomato, it, it's red. So it's suggesting that uh, we can use AV9 to get to the muscle stem cell. And we quantified that, and we found that about one third of stem cells can be targeted by using this AAV9. So this gives us opportunity in the future, we may be able to use this to get to the stem cell, to improve the regeneration uh, of the uh, uh, stem cell uh, after uh, microdystrophy gene therapy. And, and uh, one of the things that's really uh, important for, 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 for these sessions, how can we protect heart? And, and many uh, people, even myself, was thinking that dystrophy is a dystrophy. It, it, if it's in skeletal muscle, it's, uh, or irrespective it's in skeletal muscle or in the heart, it still should be a dystrophy. But when we look more detail, we find actually the same dystrophy molecule, they work differently in skeletal muscle and the heart. Let's say, for example, in the skeletal muscle, the NLs is localized to the membrane by dystrophy. Okay, sure. So, so, uh, so, uh, but, but I, I want to draw your attention to this, uh, the, the red, I, I mean, in, in the heart, this dystrophy interact with a, 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 a group of proteins. If you have mutations in those proteins, you have cardiomyopathy independent of dystrophy. So uh, we uh, look at the patients, find that in the region that between 44 and 49, uh, there is a potential region. If you have deletion in this region, then you have more severe, more early onset heart disease. And so we decide to put this region into a mini dystrophy trial and look at what make, does it make a difference or not. So th this is uh, like the white is a, uh, is a normal, and the light blue is, is the one with this, uh, without this uh, uh, repeat uh, 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 for uh, 16 to 19 regions. You can see that this is by looking at QR duration. That's uh, one of the parameters for the ECG. You can see that it's improved compared with MDX, it went up, but it's not like this, the, the same as this normal. And this is uh, the, the one that after we stick in that additional four repeats, you can see that the, the QRS duration is almost identical like the, the, the normal uh, mice. And this is looking at the end diastolic volume. And uh, this is, uh, in, without these four repeats, you can see that uh, the MDX has much reduced. Uh, this is the male mice. They have hypertrophic stage, so their volume is reduced. By giving back this uh, mini gene, we can see some improvement, but it didn't get to the normal. And now you look at that. This is uh, in a more severe uh, model, which MDX, you do see dilation. By giving this uh, 
managing with this additional four repeats, we can see that uh, the volume is almost completely normalized. And uh, so uh, we, later on, we find out this is probably, this is very likely due to an uh, interaction with uh, a particular protein, uh, Kevin 1, which is, I, I referred before, that only bind to dystrophin in the heart, but not in skeletal muscle. So also in summary that uh, we have microdystrophin, but they're suboptimal. By including endos binding domain, we can improve the muscle perfusion and exercise capacity. And also by including more membrane binding domain, at least in the mice, we see they can protect, in enhance your protection against the contraction-induced muscle injury. And, and also we have identified this putative uh, cardiac protection domain, and at least in the transient mice, we see that they have shown better uh, cardiac function uh, uh, improvement. And, and also now we have ability to, deli to deliver dystrophin stem cells, and by getting that, we will be able to improve the muscle regeneration in the stem cell. And uh, I want to thank the NIH and the parent project on muscular dystrophy, Jesse Joining and Jackson Free, a DMD research fund. And here I want to particularly want to thank Pat and the PPMD for supporting the, the, the last study on the cardiac uh, 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 domain for dystrophin. I, I submit that to a federal, and, and they, they said they don't want it. And I said, well, it's still important. Can feds, Pat said, well, we care about heart. Let's do it. So, so I'm very happy that uh, we are making progress to deliver, to generate, develop next generation of the microdystrophin that can function better than what we have today. Thank you. And actually, I, uh, I, would have, I would say, I wouldn't use the word suboptimal because it's better than a status quo, the microdystrophins that we have right now. So, but thank you very much for your work. Next, we have Dr. Lee Sweeney. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to talk a little more about the dilated cardiomyopathy that's associated with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, starting with describing a little more about the human disease and what, what you've heard about already. Um, part of our Wellstone um, Center uh, is now looking more detail at both respiratory and cardiac function. It's led by Glenn Walter, and so I'm going to show a little bit of the data on a small number of patients that we're collecting. But it, it echoes what Khan had, had said earlier, uh, namely that the early, earliest abnormality you can see in these uh, human hearts, in the Duchenne boys' hearts, uh, are the changes in strain. And remember, uh, the more negative uh, peak strain is, is better. And so when you go from the blue area of strain to the green, then that's, that's abnormal. And you can see the age at which some of these boys' hearts or, or transitioning uh, is quite young. Uh, there's, there's a six-year-old that already has abnormal strain. Many of the others don't reach this until later ages, but, but as you can see, by the age of 10 or so, most all of the, the boys have abnormal strain that you can detect in, in, the, in the heart, in the left ventricle. Uh, it's, it's not uniformly abnormal. You see it, it's the most abnormal regions are the inferior and inferior lateral. And this is borne out in, in the animal models that, that we look at as well. So, so one can look, can, one can segment the heart when one's looking at it and describe the, the peak strain in the different regions of, of, the, of the left ventricle and of the uh, septum. Furthermore, uh, following uh, these changes, uh, as, as Khan also showed, in, in, in our population, within two years, one can see changes from baseline uh, as, as these boys are, are getting older. One can see that the strain is, is getting worse. Later, uh, as Khan pointed out, you can see this, uh, this in delayed gadolinium enhancement, which is indicative of the fibrosis. The sub-epicardial uh, fibrosis is, is what you can er earlier see. But there's actually diffuse fibrosis throughout the heart that's not so easily imaged that we can appreciate by looking uh, at animal models. 
And this was an interesting paper that came out in 2015, uh, which really gets to the point, why, why am I calling this a dilated cardiomyopathy? Because these hearts actually aren't dilating. Uh, and so what the, this paper pointed out was what they called tonic contraction, but basically what, what they meant to say was that these hearts are just very much stiffer. And the reason we don't think they dilate, like in a, in a dilated cardiomyopathy in the general population, is because the boys have such weak skeletal muscle. Uh, we, we think without the, the daily load on the heart that you would normally have when you're exercising, uh, you really aren't loading the hearts, and therefore it doesn't tend, even though they're getting weaker and even though they're getting stiffer, they're, they're not dilating. And in fact, if you look at this data, I can't point at it, but if you look at the bottom panel, uh, you, you're looking at the, the left ventricular inner diameter, and, and that line uh, that's across that the, the, the points of straddling is the normative value. And what you can see is the boys, as they reach age 10, uh, actually are tending to having basically smaller ventricular cavities than normal, not actually dilated. And as you can also appreciate, the boys who did not start uh, ACE inhibitors early on are even uh, smaller ventricular cavities than those who did. And what that really s says and what that correlates with is this, the fact that without the ACE inhibitors, they have more fibrosis. It's the fibrosis that's making the ventricles stiff, and therefore they don't fill very well. Uh, and, and that's why they have these uh, lesser cavities. And then what you can see as, as they get older and, and uh, the ejection fraction uh, begins to fall, and on the top panel is, is fractional shortening. Fractional shortening is, is directly related to the ejection fraction. You, you can see, again, the, the red, the boys who were not on ACE inhibitors start losing uh, ejection fraction or fractional shortening starts to decrease earlier. And at the same time, uh, when that happens, their hearts actually do begin to truly dilate. So uh, it's, this, this brings two points home. One, this, this fibrosis uh, limits the ability of the hearts to, to dilate during uh, diastole. And furthermore, this, I think, brings home further evidence that the earlier that you start the boys on ACE inhibitors, uh, the longer their hearts are going to stay in the normal functional range. Now, I wanted to show this old slide of mine because uh, I, I want to talk about what's different about the skeletal muscle and the heart and why we have to think about maybe treating them differently with, with gene therapy. This is showing um, a series of very high force eccentric contractions in, in a skeletal muscle uh, from a mouse and showing that it, it does damage, as, as you can see, by the entry of dye. So the, the membrane normally shouldn't allow this to happen. Uh, at the same time, the membrane is, is, has these big holes ripped in it because of the loss of dystrophin. You're losing the ability of the muscle to generate force. Now you think, well, God, if that happened in the heart, five beats later, I'd, my heart would stop and that'd be, it wouldn't pump any blood and I'd, I'd be dead. So why is that not happening in the heart? Well, these are extremely high forces. In the heart, the heart, basically because it has to contract all the time for your whole life, has been engineered with a huge safety factor in it. The cardiac cells generate very low forces compared to the skeletal muscles. And so the amount of damage that's done by the sort of contraction-induced injury is, is much, much lower in the heart because of this. And the same thing you can demonstrate in skeletal muscle. If I were to do hundreds of low twitch contractions in the skeletal muscle, and in fact we showed this in this paper, you, you actually do very little damage compared to a handful of very high force contractions. So the heart's partially protected by that. It's also protected because there's much more upregulation of eutrophin in the heart. And as you may recall, eutrophin can actually replace dystrophin uh, and partially reconstitute the, the, the complex at the membrane and, and form this force transmission pathway. If you're missing both eutrophin and dystrophin, then all you've got left is integrins to, to uh, transmit force, and then 
you're in trouble because they can't withstand the forces that muscle contracts with, and so you do damage. So because of this, we think the high eutrophin is partially protective in the heart, and also the low forces are protective. So the heart doesn't fail right away, and as you know, the heart doesn't have regenerative capacity. So then, so what else is contributing to the heart disease? Well, as Dong Shen talked about, there are a lot of members of the complex that dystrophin organizes, and the importance of those also probably varies between skeletal muscle and the heart. You've heard a lot about NNOS. Uh, Dong Shen uh, referred to a, a channel that's associated with, with the, uh, a calcium channel that's associated with the um, complex. And I'm going to tell you about uh, another type of uh, channel that's associated with the complex. But the bottom line is besides this mechanical role, in both skeletal muscle and in the heart, dystrophin organizes a complex that has a number of signaling roles, including key roles in calcium homeostasis. So in skeletal muscle, you know, this mechanical damage because of the, the loss of its, its major mechanical transduction net, uh, pathway leads to this massive ion influx, including calcium, that breaks down the gradients, that damages the cells, and basically leads to death of the cells, uh, inflammation, uh, fibrosis, repair uh, to, a, to a degree which eventually fails. So in the heart where there is no repair, uh, obviously the damage is much less, but how, much, how important then are the other roles of dystrophin in the heart, the organizing role and the signaling role? So Dong Chen just showed you data from the study that this, this slide represents, the fact that there are domains that seem to be more important in the heart than than in skeletal muscle. And we, we already knew this from Becker patients because there, there are a subset of Becker patients that have a more severe cardiomyopathy than they do a skeletal muscle disease. And so they, they can still, some of these patients still ambulate quite well and yet have a, a life-threatening cardiomyopathy. So we already knew that, that segments of dystrophin that are important for the heart aren't necessarily as important for skeletal muscle. We don't exactly know all of the, the reasons, and we, Dong Shen pointed out that repeats 16 through 19 seem to be critically important, but there may be other re regions that are important as well for, for other members of the complex. So based on that, it's, it's unlikely that any of these microdystrophins that are currently in clinical trial are going to completely rescue the heart. We may be setting up a situation that's, that's more like these Becker patients that have a, a, a cardiomyopathy that's actually worse than the skeletal muscle disease they have. Now, this is not a rapidly onset, this disease does not have a rapid onset. Uh, it's, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s in, in the Becker patients, and so it's not going to show up anytime soon. Uh, in these patients who are being treated with microdystrophins, if, if ever, but, but, but bear in mind that there is this possibility, and therefore, what can we do about it? Well, I think one thing we can do about it is, besides thinking only about replacement of dystrophin and eutrophin, we can think about some of the downstream uh, drivers of disease. So these are the ones that I, I usually talk about for skeletal muscle, and these are a lot of the ones that you hear about at this meeting that are being uh, examine, but when we go to the when we go to the heart, uh, two of these really come off the table. And what we're really talking about in in slowing the progression of the heart is is trying to delay or or mitigate this excessive calcium uptake, which ultimately is 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 not handled well by the the, the cells and leads to. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, free radical generation, uh, even apoptosis of the cardiomyocytes, which is how these dilated cardiomyopathies really progress and why, why the ventricles eventually dilate. Now, one component that's probably not being localized properly or has been shown not to be localized properly are, the, are these so-called uh, stretch-activated ion channels, these TRPS-C channels that are found both in skeletal muscle and in the heart. 
Now, in the skeletal muscle, years ago, there were a number of papers suggesting that that contributed uh, substantially to the disease. But I think at this point, people think it's only a minor contribution. But in the heart, it may be a very different matter. And I'll, I'll show you some pharmacological data that uh, maybe will convince you that it is, it is a significant contributor, not the sole contributors to why the, some dystrophins might not be as good for the heart as they are for the skeletal muscle. So this is looking at this calcium leak that's coming from these, these mislocalized and dysregulated TRIP-C channels with a, a pharmacological agent, Tadalafil. Now, you know Lily had Tadalafil in trial, and that was because of the skeletal muscle problem, because of the lack of NNOS, because the dystrophin is not there to localize it, the membrane, you're not getting uh, dilation of the vascular smooth muscle in the, in the skeletal muscle. But in the heart, uh, another function of, of the, the downstream of nitric oxide and the activation of cyclic, uh, of um, the, the uh, production of cyclic GMP and the activation of uh, protein kinase G or PKG uh, is the fact that these TRIP channels, these TRIP-C channels, can be partially silenced by being phosphorylated by PKG. So there is this other potential benefit of tadalafil in the heart uh, by trying to at least partially silence this calcium leak. And so we looked at that uh, in, in animals, and, and we measured, uh, again, uh, this, this, this strain, this circ circumferential strain analysis. Uh, and uh, again, as I said before, we divided the heart uh, into various segments so that we could look at the strain in different regions. And what we saw with very acute, with, with just a few weeks of Tadalafil treatment, we saw that the strain actually improved with the treatment. Uh, and, and this was true for the overall heart and, 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 and very much so for, for segment five here, this inferior lateral um, segment. Now, if we treated for a long time, for 18 months, or, or, or till the animals were 25 months old. What we saw was, we, by 18 months, we still had some improvement in strain, but we had lost it all by 25 months. And this was also true if we looked at fractional shortening or ejection fraction, that basically what we had done with this treatment was delayed the onset of functional loss of the cardiomyopathy. We hadn't stopped it, so it's not the sole problem for the heart, but it, it certainly slowed it down a bit. Uh, and just in, totally in line with what we saw with the strain changes, we saw a slowing of the, the loss of, of pumping ability as well. When we tried to look at the mechanism, obviously we looked at both the TRIP-C and uh, six and, and three channels, which were in the heart, and in fact we were able to uh, decrease the, the amount of the TRIP-C six channels as well as the phosphorylation. But the other surprise was in doing so, we actually led to a lower activation of M-calpane. Now, M-calpane is a protease that's activated by membrane calcium fluxes that can um, degrade a number of contractile proteins, and this includes eutrophin. So what we saw was not only did we essentially um, lower TRIP-C probably leak, but we also lowered the activation of this protease, M-calpane, and spared a lot of the calpane cleavage products, including eutrophin, which led to more complex at the membrane as, as judged by the increase in sarcoglycan in these hearts as well. So we had two benefits of this drug, and this, just to show that, you, that this might be relevant to humans, uh, is we also see an increase in m calpane activity in the human heart, the human Duchenne heart, and, and also, uh, just as I told you, you see in the animals, there's a massive increase in the amount of eutrophin in the human heart, but judging by the activation of m, m calpane, you might be able to get even more eutrophin in the human heart if you could quiet down this calcium leak. So just to summarize what we saw with Tadalafil was that this TRIP-C phosphorylation levels were decreased about twofold, eutrophin levels went up by about one and a half to twofold, uh, and the progression of disease was delayed in the animals by about 15 months. 
Now, we think that this might be able to slow cardiac disease progression and BMD, DMD. There might be better ways to address this pharmacologically, but we also think that this whole calcium leak and mitochondrial dysfunction can be addressed by gene therapy. Uh, and, and that's really what we think the goal should be, to try to augment the ability of whatever microdystrophin is designed by helping g with gene therapy, also addressing the calcium dysfunction uh, as, as well as the mitochondrial dysfunction. So the questions that we're asking, uh, and, and this is uh, funded by the parent project primarily, uh, is, well, we're not asking the microdystrophin question, but parent project is funding uh, work in Dong Shen's lab to address this idea. Can, can you design a microdystrophin that can totally rescue the heart, or is that just impossible given the small size that the AAV will accommodate? We think you can address the calcium handling and the mitochondrial function with gene therapy, and you could use that either alone in the heart or in combination with a microdystrophin to try to provide more benefit than a microdystrophin alone. And maybe, maybe just addressing the calcium handling and mitochondrial dysfunction all by itself would be highly efficacious, and that's something you could look at short-term in Becker patients. As I said, it'll be a long time before we know what microdystrophin is really doing in the hearts of these Duchenne boys who are being treated, but we do know that there are Becker patients whose heart disease is, is more of a problem than their skeletal muscle disease, and so we could try to address that with AAV gene therapy. Um, we, we think it might someday be possible to deliver both a cardiac-specific AAV to address calcium handling uh, and mitochondrial dysfunction at the same time you deliver a microdystrophin. Uh, and in the case of the cardiac-specific vector, you'd only have to deliver it to the heart, not body-wide like you would the microdystrophin. And, and the good news, uh, as, as you heard this morning, is unlike the case of skeletal muscle, if you treat the heart, it's probably never going to be redosed because those cells are there uh, forever and are not replaced. And so one, one time dosing with gene therapy is all the heart needs. So as I say, this work is uh, funded uh, in large part by the parent project. And uh, I also would like to acknowledge the support of our Wellstone grant from NIAMS uh, and the people in the lab who are doing the work. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. That was really exciting. And now our last speaker, in the interest of time, and if we can stay on time, um, we have Dr. Larry Markham from uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, I've since moved from Vanderbilt and am now at um, Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis, but some of the work I'm going to talk about began through collaborations at Vanderbilt. I'll start with saying I have no uh, direct uh, financial conflicts, and although I am the PI for the trial that will be described, I have no salary support or financial connection. And so Cumberland Pharmaceuticals is a specialty pharmaceutical company which headquarters in Nashville, and they're developing products for unmet needs. They have several products that are being developed and their pipeline uh, and work is collaborating with research centers to develop one compound, a fitraban, for various orphan indications. Uh, the theme is fibrosis and scarring, uh, which is how I came to be acquainted with them, and I'll go through the story uh, a little bit. But a fitraban has been administered in 16 phase one trials and 11 phase two studies in cardiovascular disease, renal injury, and liver disease. And so ifitraban is a potent and selective antagonist of the thromboxane receptor, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. And as I said, it has been studied and safety is well established. Over 1,300 clinical trial participants dosed in over 26 clinical studies and doses up to 1,000 milligrams have been administered without serious effects. And so you've seen slides like this through various presentations which show the impact of loss of or mutations in the dystrophin gene impacting the dystrophin protein 
and as Lee just mentioned, the impact of intracellular calcium and the cascade of events in which that activates. And that all results in cardiac myocyte death, apoptosis, uh, which then begets itself onto this inflammatory response and fibrosis formation. And so then we start to see changes in left ventricular volume. Um, and I would agree with all the data that has been shared early in life. These boys have typically small hearts, and it's really only late after you have profound dysfunction that you start to see dilation. But wall stress and relaxation are abnormalities which are present early. And so a fitraban uh, blocks uh, some of the elements of this cascade, which I will go through. And so uh, it has been shown in Duchenne and Becker patients, as well as non-Duchenne heart failure patients, that um, one ligand of the thromboxane receptor uh, is elevated in patients and the receptors are present in cardiomyocytes, immune cells, the endothelium, as well as smooth muscle cells, which makes it attractive uh, for Duchenne. And ephytraban blocks all of those elements, and this pathway uh, begins with arachidonic acid, which is how aspirin works, um, and then there are other anti-inflammatory agents, which uh, are impacted, but the final common pathway is fibrosis. And so this just goes with the theme of a lot of talks that you will hear is if we keep an open mind and we prepare ourselves to work with other people, oftentimes we can be pulled in areas that we didn't think uh, were possible. Uh, so some of this work in a fitter band that I will show began in the work of Erica Carrier and James West, who are pulmonary hypertension specialists at Vanderbilt. And they started working with this drug and looking at pulmonary hypertension and the effect on right ventricular strain. And they showed that a fitter band, which I'll, I'll show you the slide, had impact on fibrosis in the right ventricle. And so we had a journal club for our neuromuscular group uh, at Vanderbilt, and they came and presented their work and said, do you all know anything about myocardial fibrosis? And is there a disease where the use of this drug might apply? I do, Duchenne. Um, the work of Khan and Linda and, and everyone else uh, showing myocardial fibrosis. But very briefly, this is their initial work looking at fibrosis and cardiac dysfunction in a pulmonary hypertension model. And on the bottom left for you, uh, IFE, which is uh, the middle category, showed that fibrosis was less uh, in the treated animals, whereas aspirin and another agent in that pathway did not do the same effect. But also, they were doing heart casts on these mice and they found that cardiac index and fractional shortening could be improved with treatment. And so this is where foundations come into play, and, and I will talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Um, but with my involvement and, and then uh, one of our local foundations, but also in our communications with PPMD, we were able to provide them with some money to study uh, this in Shen animal models. And so we took the double knockout mice for eutrophin and dystrophin, and we took the MDX uh, telomere mouse um, and studied them. And the first, uh, the panels A and C show that uh, those mice did not survive, but treatment with ephetraban um, took a 60% survival to 100% survival and a 40% survival to 100% survival with treatment. And so we started to ask the question, why? And we did not see a significant change in fractional shortening, which as you've already learned, can be a very late finding. However, uh, the blue bars are the treated animals. We did see an improvement in cardiac index, which was an invasive measure of heart cath 
and uh, stroke volume. Uh, and interestingly enough, when we looked at individual muscle cells, it was actually an improvement in the loading conditions, an improvement in the relaxation of, of these cells. Um, and so we think that a fitter band had an impact on the degree of fibrosis. Um, in order to see if this held true in another uh, animal model, we took the um, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy mouse, which had a better survival um, of 90% survival that was improved to 100%. Um, and we saw the same effects of improvements um, in cardiac parameters, but because the mouse lived, we were able to look at that mouse in a little more detail um, and showed that in the delta sarcoglycan mouse, there was an improvement in fibrosis, so less scar in those muscles, and that was quantified in panel B by the collagen positive areas. And then there was a su suggestion that, that the TGF beta pathway was implicated in that uh, improvement in fibrosis. <coughs> and so that work uh, was funded uh, by the Marlin family and their foundation uh, in Nashville, Fight DMD, but um, some of those studies were also prompted by my discussions with other members of the PPMD community and so we have embarked to work with Cumberland Pharmaceuticals to develop a clinical trial for a fitraban for cardiac outcomes. And so what does this trial look like? The inclusion uh, criteria is for boys seven years and older with a diagnosis of Duchenne who have either been on stable oral corticosteroids or have elected not to use steroids. Uh, but cardiac measures have to be stable over the last 12 months, and that's defined as very little change in ejection fraction and no heart failure admission. But uh, we will study uh, and involve patients who have an ejection fraction above 35%. So even if you already have some heart muscle weakness and if you have fibrosis already, we will consider that as well. Uh, because this, in my view, is an additive therapy to standard of care, current medications will be allowed, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, or ARBs, if you are on them, as well as spironolactone or aplerinone, as long as you have been on them for either three months or 12 months, respectively. Exclusion criteria really relate to the ability to perform a cardiac MRI. Um, and even if someone has been in a therapeutic trial, um, as long as you've had drug washout, um, that individual would be allowed. Because of the interactions with uh, platelets, uh, anyone with a known bleeding disorder or anticoagulant therapy would, would be excluded uh, within two weeks of study entry, and then other MRI contraindications would apply. So the study looks something like this, where 48 boys, uh, and we um, sought input uh, from various uh, groups of people to try to make this friendly um, to patients. Uh, and we also wanted to see if there would be an impact on disease severity. So those with an EF of less than 45% will be in one group, or greater than 45% will be in one group and those with more significantly affected heart would be in another group, and then we would randomize them to placebo, low dose, and high dose, and then stratify based on their ejection fraction. And so the objective is to evaluate efficacy, safety, and pharmacokinetics of a fitraban in Duchenne. This is a daily oral medication uh, for 12 months, and as you can see in the outline, uh, two-thirds of the subjects will be randomized to a fitter band for that first year, and then open a label extension will, is planned to follow there. Uh, we planned three months, uh, three visits over the 12 months with intervening phone calls and other communications, but this would include cardiac MRI, 
pulmonary function testing, muscle testing, and then seven-day actigraphy, which is basically a Fitbit to see how active an individual is. And key assessments, as I mentioned, uh, one thing we worked on uh, from a pharmacokinetic standpoint was I was not going to ask a patient to stay in the hospital for one or two days just for us to measure. And so Cumberland worked with a pharmacokinetic uh, group, and we actually have a finger uh, prick protocol that we're going to pilot to do the PK portion of this such that initial dosing and initial test would be done at the study site but subsequent testing would be done at home and it's a little cardboard kit that can be mailed in so patients do not have to spend the night. Uh, again, key eligibility is all boys regardless of mutation, ambulatory status, or steroid use. No upper age limit and standard of care medications are allowed. And so these are the expected sites uh, that we have communicated with and we're working towards getting enrollment beginning later this year. Uh, Indianapolis, uh, Nashville, Columbus, uh, DC, Atlanta, uh, UCLA, and Yale in Connecticut. And so I want to say in conclusion that um, this and my thinking about this trial has really come from decades of work going back to my beginning in training in Linda. And I would say PPD, PPMD's involvement, um, and as I think about them as an organization and some of the comments that are raised, and I thank you for the opportunity to come, really centers on people. And so um, if you have an idea uh, that could impact Duchenne, uh, PPMD will listen. If they have the means to support you, they will. Um, but that not only is from a clinician standpoint, but I think that extends to a mother, a father, a grandparent, and then to all the boys who are affected. And so that's why this organization is um, successful, is because it believes in people. And if you invest in people, then you will have success um, because it's the people who will drive forward. And so I thank you for the time. So that was a great panel. We, um, we have time for just a few questions. And um, also, you have to stay for the polling or Ryan will shoot me, OK? So please, after the questions, don't run out. Wait for Ryan. So do we have any questions from the audience? You want to go to the mic? That way everybody can hear. I can repeat it, but it's easier. What do you want me to say? <laughs> can you say your name okay. and? And, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Karen Stoller. My grandson, Noah, has Duchenne. He's 21. He has no fibrosis, and I, his heart and lungs are great. I am a carrier. I have fibrosis. And when I was listening to Dr. Markham, I thought, I am in all those, I'm even over seven, you know, I'm, I'm perfect candidate. Could a, a woman who is a carrier be involved in the ifitriban, or is it just for those who have Duchenne only, not carriers? None of them work. There we go. Um, so this this uh, drug has never been applied in, in Duchenne or dystrophinopathy right, at, right. at all. And so this is going to be the first step. But in, in my mind, I don't see any reason why it is just for boys. And so I, I think that that is a, an acceptable avenue to think that, okay, if there is a signal there and it seems to have some role I, I don't see why it would be limited. 
So maybe someday I could take this drug too and it is supposed to get rid of the fibrosis I have now? We don't know about get rid. I would, I well, would I was not listening be that to optimistic, but, but impact. We'll okay. say impact. We'll start there uh, before being overly optimistic. I'm going okay. I'm going to add to we had a yes. trial prior to I mean a, a conference prior to the start of this larger conference yeah. about carrier women who have um, cardiomyopathy and so a question to Larry is even though she's aged out of this current trial would some a lot of the carrier females or manifesting carrier females um, shared with us that they aren't eligible for any clinical trials. Could they participate in this trial? Um, I, that hasn't been the uh, plan as of yet, but, but I think that could be a discussion um, to find those patients and, and figure out. Um, Good. Because a, a lot of them would be seen at the same sites okay. that are caring for the boys. I'll take that to Cumberland and tell them. Okay. So in the meantime, are you on either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or any medication for your cardiac condition? Who, who am I talking to? I, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> when it just comes, you don't know. Um, I'm on lisinopril right now, but on the 18th of July, I'm doing an electrophysiology study. I mean, they're talking possible defibrillator, and I would like to avoid that. I mean, shoot, if I can take this drug and get rid of the fibrosis, <laughs> then I don't have to have defibrillators and all this other very scary equipment in me. Well, so. I get the scary equipment because it might be a lot of years <laughs> until we. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want to address that if you have fibrosis, when you have scar formation fibrosis, there's been no proof that any drug reverses this, and this has been known in stem cell therapy and myocardial infarction. Okay. I think when we see enhancement in MRI, it may be indicating injury because of re retention of the contrast. So I think it's important to know that when you say fibrosis, it's, it's true scar versus fibrosis by imaging. We know that, that all that stuff is evolving, so if, but it does preserve your, it can't, if, if it's supposed to work, it preserves the rest of your normal uh, heart muscle cells. Okay. All right, I'm good. I'm crossing my fingers. I really would like to get involved in this. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Next. Thank you, uh, Sarah Kasner. I have two little boys, Caleb and Duncan, who are four and five. Um, my question is, the standards of care recommend um, interventions with heart medicine before 10, but is there any harm in starting as early as four or five as a preventative me measure? No, no, and I think that's a question that we are very commonly asked, and, and I think if you intellectually think about the process, you say, well, the cardiologists say the, that at, even at birth, we can see changes in the myocardium because many of the infants who are diagnosed prenatally have EKG changes. So you know the myocardium has um, damage to the muscle, even though we can't see it because we're not using tools that allow us to see that. So intellectually, you start to say, wow, why, if you're telling me you could use ACE inhibitors or um, angiotensin receptor blockers at um, 10, why couldn't we use it at one? And I think that's a very appropriate intellectual argument, and, and families who want to start these things earlier, I am completely supportive of. Um, you're going to get a lot of diversity amongst cardiologists depending upon their familiarity with the disease. Um, so I think that we have the standard age of 10 because we would like everybody to have started by before then, but there's no reason to not start earlier. I, I will also qualify that with saying that even though intellectually I think that you can make the argument that there's going to be benefit, we're unlikely to ever demonstrate that in a randomized controlled clinical trial. And and is it uh, lisinopril or losartan? Is there a preference between? No. no Sprite and 7-Up are pretty both similar tasting drugs. I mean, not drugs. <laughs> drinks, drinks, not drugs. Um, sorry, my name is Joanna Ferguson. I have two sons, Jack and Wyatt, who are six and seven. Um, and my question is, with the ifetriban in previous clinical trials, can you say what common and significant adverse effects have occurred? 
or have been seen? Um, I have the, the whole list and it was the similar to any other clinical trial. So like the regular nausea, vomiting, headache kind no, of stuff like that? No, you know, some had a headache, some had a rash, some, but nothing, but nothing significant. Nothing like that was a trend and nothing injury. that was significant. <laughs> Um, and my second question, with the PDE5 inhibitors, is there any talk about um, doing a study to see if that may be helpful in these patients? Well, as you, as you probably know, Lily did a trial that was looking at the skeletal muscle, and it, it failed to improve their walking. Uh, there was a small sub-study that was done looking at the cardiac muscle, mm -hmm. uh, which did trend to show some, some changes, but it was too small a study. and so. I think it would be warranted to do a, another study. I mean, at our own institution, one of my colleagues is trying to raise money to do a follow-on study to the to Dalafil, so that if if she's successful in doing so, then we will have a, a small study going to look at this again. Okay, thank you. Well, these are the last two questions, by the way, and then we'll do the polling. Bob. <laughs> Switch. Where's the switch? Uh, I just have a quick question for Dr. Markham. On the study, because of the thromboxane inhibition and the fact that almost all the patients will be on high-dose corticosteroids, is part of the safety protocol to have GI monitoring for uh, potential GI bleeding? Yes, that'll be part of it um, as well. Um, and one of the things that I, I didn't mention, but because of its impact on skeletal muscle, um, Dr. Carrier um, is looking at transit time through the colon and bowel for these mice, and she's trying to figure out how to measure it. She started with these little beads and tried to track them through the GI tract. Um, there was some suggestion that maybe their motility was improved. Um, so that will be part of the questionnaire is GI related, but also constipation and motility and those kinds of things. Uh, yes, I'd like to step back to the lisinopril versus losartan question. Uh, I, I know that there was a, a clinical study that found uh, that when losartan was expensive, there was a study that found equivalency for heart, for cardiac protection of the two drugs, and losartan was not adopted. I also know that losartan's a potent inhibitor of TGF-beta, and that TGF-beta um, is the primary inflammation in adults, or in humans with Duchenne. So should we not be at least studying, if not treating with losartan over losinopril, they're the same cost, but perhaps additional benefit to skeletal muscle for losartan. To answer that, uh, you know, I, 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 will, I will say that in clinical practice, we've not seen any difference between patients treated with losartan or lisinopril, and it may be that those differences in, in the real world, um, in the Duchenne population, are not, um, are not measurable. Um, over the time courses that, you know, we're following these patients, though I do understand the, um, the differences in the, in the laboratory. I don't know, Lee, do you want to comment on that? Well, we, we, long term, we were unable to show any difference between the two. They were both equally cardioprotective, and long term, they didn't really give rise to lower um, fibrosis, maybe a little bit, but, but not significant like some of the earlier publications uh, had suggested. And those were more short-term benefits, but they, they weren't borne out long-term. So I think in terms of cardiac protection, either an ACE or an ARB uh, is probably equally effective. Um, you know, the ACE inhibitor, there's a small percentage of the population, including my own family, that can't tolerate ACE inhibitors, and so, so my sister and mother are treated with ARBs, but, but uh, if other than that, I, I don't know. I mean, all of these drugs have off-target effects, and so some of the off-target effects are more attractive than others, and so you could, you could look at it that way. I mean, lisinopril is an MMP9 inhibitor, uh, telmosartan is a PPR 
uh, P par gamma activator. So they all, they all have a little something extra than what you're taking them for, and so you might make your decisions based on that. I will say, in, in addition, and, and I think this is one thing that's important for everybody, is when you start a medicine, you, in your mind, start it for a reason, and you start it at a dose that you want to have some effect but minimize side effect. And I think what I've seen for a lot of Duchenne, and I know Linda and I feel the same way because we've shared patients and we actually do the same thing in, in communicating with each other, is, you know, a five-year-old who starts two and a half milligrams of, of lisinopril, by the time they're 10, they shouldn't still be on two and a half milligrams of lisinopril, but sometimes we get caught in this oh, I put you on a medicine, and so you just stay on that medicine, and, and we actually need to track dosing and, and growth and have you on a medicine that actually is appropriate for your size and your condition, and, and sometimes I see that that doesn't happen. Sure. Yeah, and I would just make one more additional comment. I think, I think there's a lot of misinformation on social media about Lasartan and lisinopril, and, and, and I think, like Lee mentioned, it, it, there's a very sophisticated knowledge set that goes into thinking about these decisions, and there isn't a right or wrong. And, and I oftentimes have families come in saying, oh my gosh, I'm taking the wrong drug because on Facebook I read that I really should be taking Losartan instead of Losinopril. And so I would say, you know, I would encourage you to be wary of social media in this environment. Um, in, the, in the Duchenne world, I, I realize that there is value there in, in, in some in some instances, but um, talk to your providers. Um, your providers spend years in training, and, and, and if you don't like the advice you're getting from one of your providers, then seek information from somebody else that you may, you may trust. But these decisions are complex ones, and, and the background information is complex. Okay, thank you. I, just talking with parents, my observation has been that a lot of the boys who have done better and walked longer were taking Losartan but they also, historically, they were for families who invested more in their child's care because Losartan was a more expensive drug. So correlation versus causation, there's, there's no, you know, yeah. it's not there. And there's no study, as far as I know, in humans of does one of them work better or the other for muscle, only for heart. So it's something I'd love to see studied. And you're not, and unfortunately, for reasons that um, have to do with ability to recruit, ability, you know, in, in this day and age where there's a limited number of patients available for, for clinical trials of significance, um, you know, the question of whether you want to do Lusartan or Lisinopril is probably a $5 million trial, $5 million trial that's going to occur over a five-year period of time, and you, you may have to have restrictions that you can't participate in gene therapy trials. You're just not going to be able to recruit that trial. So I don't think we're ever going to have an answer to that question from a prospective side, but I think we have enough <clears throat> information from other realms and in other patient populations to at least help guide informed decisions. Okay, thanks very much, panelists. That was a really wonderful session. We now have Ryan for some polling. And one other announcement. We are gonna start the next, we're gonna start the next session on inflammation, the companies presenting in the inflammation and fibrosis category immediately after the polling just to get us back on time. So do what you have to do, but we're gonna start right away. Thanks. Good job. All right, me again. Get out your phones, people. Okay. You can pull up the first question. It's about um, trial decision making. And I'm going to give you a second on this. We want to know which statement best describes your decision making process for enrolling in a clinical trial. First, I research all trials on my own to determine the best for me, my child, then work with my clinician to enroll. I discuss trials with my clinician. Together we decide. I do not file, uh, follow trials closely and my clinician keeps me up to date. I skip my clinician altogether, directly contact sites, and I, file, I, I follow the uh, trial advances closely, watch for potential approved therapies. Or you're not interested in clinical trials, and that's okay too.
I know they're still trickling in. These are long responses, so I'm just going to give you a second. Okay. Give it one more second. Appreciate everyone answering these. These are really important to help inform all those we work with in clinical trials. Okay, let's do the next question. We want to know what your current steroid regimen is if you are on steroids. Pretty straightforward question. Looks like some are still trickling in. Pretty high number for never used steroids. <clears throat> if you answered the age question yesterday from the poll, we'll be able to stratify and look at how those correlate. I swear it's just one more question. Okay, let's do the final question for this set. Okay, in your view, based on your own personal experience as well as what you've been told or learned about steroids, which of the following do you agree with? Prednisone is more effective than deflazacort. Prednisone and deflazacort are equally effective. When we say deflazacort, same thing with emphalaza, so um, not to confuse anybody. See the answer still trickling in. Looks like majority of flascord is more effective than prednisone, but closer behind is unsure. Okay. Thank you very much.